Make sure we're ready to go. There it is. Well, everyone, good afternoon, good evening, bienvenidos. Fabulous to be with you here today. It's a Sunday, first Sunday in June. I want to wish everyone a happy Pride Month. We've come been coming off um, the a celebration of Asian American Pacific Islander writers here in the States for the month of May. And now we move toward a celebration in the month of June of our LGBTQ plus community members. I've got my pride flag up for the month of for the month of June, and we're going to be uh, really celebrating uh, with our readings during this the, during this month and many many opportunities for you to share in the pride celebration uh, however you allow yourself and identify well it's our first reading of the sunday of of the month of june and our first sundays as many of you know here in the room in our Zoom room live, and those of you might be watching live on Facebook, it's our poets focus. We choose a particular theme and, and open mic explores that theme wildly and abundantly. So today we'll be featuring our 12 readers and get to as many folks on the open mic as we can on off of the waiting list. Our theme today for our poets focus is rhythm and rhyme. Before I get started and invite our first reader for today, I just I want to just uh, share a personal note. Um, you know, because we're connected so closely all through Facebook, uh, you know, I posted about my mom who's uh, been hospitalized and I just want to, on behalf of my entire family, my sister and my brother and I, uh, and my mom, of course, who's often here with us in the audience, I want to just say uh, how much we really have appreciated the tremendous outpouring of your healing energy and good thoughts and uh, we'll continue to provide updates for you all. Um, but again, um, it's just, it's, it, it's just so humbling and we're so, so, so grateful. So uh, thank you. Th thank you, everyone, um, truly. Um, you know, uh, I was at Lime Square on Thursday, which was the first day she was actually in the hospital and things were just very, very tentative. And I honestly felt that the, the healing from that poetry reading helped her st start to take a turn for the turn for the better. So we, my whole family and my mom in particular and I, we really, really believe in the healing power of what we do when we get together in community and share poetry. So I'm hoping that we're gonna, Don so dutifully records all these sessions and we're looking forward to sharing today's session with her as well when she's feeling up to um, listening and watching. So again, just thank you so much. Well, on that note, let's 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 get to the music. Let's 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 get to the let's get to the beautiful beautiful energy for today and move on to hear from our featured poets for our reading today on the focus and feature of rhythm and rhyme. So many, it's gonna be fascinating to see what you've all brought to the table today. And uh, just a reminder that those of you who are in the featured spots, you'll be reading for up to five minutes. If you have less, that creates some time for folks get to us to the open mic and we'll be going to the end of the uh we'll be going to the half hour 
on the second hour uh, 90 minute program today. Well, first up today, beautiful to see Mary Louise Kiernan and she'll be followed by Michael Amara. Hi, it's great to be here as always. Um, in 2016, I had the good fortune to be accepted into the New York State Writers Institute. And the concept of an anti-poem was discussed. So I thought, what, what could I possibly write? And then I thought, well, I'm going to write an anti-rhyme poem. And once I started, I started to channel Ogden Nash. It ended up being all in quatrains. And of course it rhymed. So I'll show you what it looks like on the page here. So it's eight, eight stanzas uh, of four lines rhyming quatrain about anti-rhyme. Got no time for rhyme or lines constrained, missing Ogden Nash. Fine rhyme in time, tap sublime, I can do it, but I issue it. Make me A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, and I shall go back crap crazy. I could rock round the clock in accents of three and rhyme some of the time, but I gotta be me. If your posy is rosy, we shan't be getting cozy. To write me sing song to the nursery be gone. Sonnets like a bonnet, too tight to don it. To refrain a quatrain, not worth the strain. Sestina, count the ways, it's six times the pain. And if I continue to verse, this will only get worse. Only pap can I rap, which sounds like crap. Too old to be bold, yet still got the gold. From the profs who gave me props for my Free form blanking verse. No curse could be worse for me or thee to keep on rapping, cause I'll be up that yonder tree. Now let's all be slap happy that this is Feeny. The end. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I crack myself up sometimes. <laughs> 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 that is Mary Louise Kiernan. Uh, perfect opening to today's Poets Focus on rhythm and rhyme with her anti rhyme rhyming poem. Fantastic. I love how you even got like the rhyme scheme, like into the poem, the A, you know, the A, B, B. <laughs> that, Oh, fabulous. I fact. have no idea how that happened, where it came from. It just oh, really, I love it. Urged. And, and I laughed the whole way through, and I still laugh at it when I read it. <laughs> thank you for well, listening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, folks, this is, you know, this is, this is, this is the magic. This is the alchemy of what we aspire to, uh, you know, produce together. Uh, you know, Kim and I, you know, noodle about something and we're like, yeah, people are, just, you know, they'll, they'll bring it, they'll bring it. So always here's more evidence just of that. Exactly. Well, next we get to hear from Michael Macklin. Amara. Hi, Michael. How are you? I am well, Sandy. It's good to see you again. I saw the um, prompt and I thought rhythm rhyme with an undercurrent of pride. I think I can do that. <laughs> so, so here goes. The wee folk. When I was neither man nor woman, I was spirit. And when both, it was a Tuesday morning. The milkman was rattling at the back door. Already the blue jays found much to scream about. Coffee percolated on the stove with a heavy inhale, exhale alacrity of a little iron lung. 
We learned to field strip the pot and its innards in our grade school days from our Nana, who, when fresh from Ireland, had been a Kennebunkport domestic. On this morning, after the glass crown at the pot's top had achieved its seven and a half minute show of ecstasy, spurting from clear to amber to, to a brown we call black. There was no milk. Only a past due note was left where the milkman had picked up the well scrub empties. Before I went begging, I checked the sugar bin as well. Most every house had light twinkling in the frost of their kitchen window, but which could keep a secret? Our uncle's house was dark. I removed the paper caps from each of the four bottles at his back door and poured one ounce from each quart into my measuring cup. Two for the cup and two for the thermos. Forgive me, I prayed as I replaced the lids and hurried home. It was a few weeks gathering later when talk turned to the old country, and my uncle asked whether those assembled thought the wee folk had made the journey as well. I swear I've spied a thieving fairy or two, he nearly winked, like kittens milk. I hid the face that would betray me. Was it only he who knew? They're a half step closer to the angels, Nana replied. Full of luck and grace, they are. My uncle nodded. And that was that. Thank you. What a beautiful contribution to the reading. Oh. You know, I love how, I love how rhythm and story converge. They enhance, one enhances the other. That was just enthralling. Absolutely enthralling. Thank you so much. Michael Macklin O'Mara, and great to see you here today. Um, I hope you'll be here with us the whole month if you can make it. Well, next we hear from our good friend. So nice to see Dom with for on the on the on the camera for a little bit in our pre warm up, <sighs> and uh, and uh, but okay. You know, we, we we welcome you. We welcome everyone. However, their squares materialize here at Cultivating Voices, and Katha will be followed by Harvey Sauce. Beautiful, beautiful to see you earlier, and I'm looking forward to hearing you this evening. Welcome. Yes, hello everybody, and hello Sandy. Um, I'm afraid my camera has uh, given up the ghost. I, I, it's, uh, there's a problem with the picture now, so there you go. Um, so I'll, I'll be as usual uh, without picture, so I'll just read you uh, a sonnet in the Shakespearean form and um, a short poem in rhyming couplets dedicated to the poet of Sappho. So here we go. First one is uh, the sonnet. It's called The Lonely Heart. Out of darkness cold in a church I walk, the evening sun seeking rest in the west, the cool of the evening by shadow stalked, the heat of day cool to its evening rest. The earth in all her evening beauty clad, her somber hues and fading gray to shade, the rustling forest leaves in morning sad, swaying to breezes from a forest glade. Not in all the world the softly silence, Treads with tender footsteps light to the touch to fill the forest air with breathing sense to lay the aching soul upon her couch. For he who walks this twilight world alone, silence must turn the lonely heart to stone. 
And if I may, I'll finish up with a short poem to Sappho. Uh, she's one of my favourite poets. And um, a new collection has come out with even more of her fragmented poetry being published. And this is just a short uh, poem to her. It's called Sappho. Why does she hold me so enthrall? Her words like scented roses fall to garland her sweet thoughts and bloom, to fill my head with their perfume and leave me lost for wanting more, to rage against that furore of lesser and graceless ages where meaner souls tore down pages of her sweet verses line by line, to burn parchment in quick line, to still her voice for future time with only fragments of her rhyme, that fall sweetly upon the lip, left lonely there without her kiss. That's it, and back to you, my friends. Back to you, Sandy. Thank you all. Oh, what a, what a, what a, what a fantastic tribute to Seth. Oh, I love that. It's, oh, that just is like, just stunning, stunning, stunning. Love that. Uh, and I what a great know. contribution to pride. What a great contribution to pride, Mon. Sappho, of course. Yes, you could indeed take that for, for your pride collection, definitely. Uh, yeah. I don't know why she's taken me so enthralled, as I say in the poem. I, I, it's just something about her, or the way she, she, she talks to us from so far away. 2002, was it? 2,600 mm. years ago. And it's just beautiful, beautiful writing. And I'm a big fan of Sappho. Oh. Well... And that is a and that is a beautiful poem in tribute to Sappho. Like just uh, you know, I you know, as 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 you're reading it, I'm thinking, hmm, we could probably do poets focus on a poet and you know, have people come because they're, you know, we're inspired by so many poets of you know from from our from our legacy our legacies and uh Sappho would be a great one to to have one of the features so thanks potentially for uh, another good i uh, another good idea you you uh created here thank you sounds good to me so sandy sounds good <laughs> have a great rest of the evening enjoy the rest of the program well I'm looking forward, as always, to hearing from Harvey Sauce with Artful Dodger, and Harvey will be followed by Michael Durack. Welcome, welcome, Harvey. Thank you, thank you, and and, and all the best to your mother. Can can you hear me? Okay, fine. This is something that I wrote today or yesterday. I'm not sure which. Uh, it's called "In the Company of Widow Makers." And the, the um, epigraph is as follows. The Wagner group is looking for a few good Ubermenschen, Evgeny Prigozhin. Always wanted to roast a baby on a spit, forever being given a week's detention when you ask your school guidance counselor where you can sign up to be a mercenary with slaughter and rape among the benefits willing to wait to be put on the waiting list, referred back to the school psychologist. If the above is the sort of thing that appeals to you, I mean, really appeals to you, you've come to the right place, boyo, this is it. If you grew up a bit twisted, essentially uninvolved, bent like an English longbow at Agincourt, lonely as that banyan tree on the cover of National Geographic, apt to punch your way through peace sign protests, come kick the can around with us, or play hot potato with a hand grenade, dropping it into an aid agency's collection box. Wagner isn't just for music anymore, not by a long shot. Our guild hall is hell. Cerberus fetches bones for us. If deep state gun laws step on your deepest impulses, unduly regulating the love of a man for his gun, testaments old and new, never having declared this a forbidden love, 
come join the fun. If you think of yourself as being more Cain than Abel, ours is a society of golden rule breakers, snuff movie connoisseurs, fratricides, widow makers. Translate your video game kill counts into real world experience. Search and destroy, crack skulls, and never fear the consequences. If you're our boy, the Hague will never touch you. And there will always be more Malaysian airliners and peace doves to shoot out of the sky. That is Harvey Sauce. Um, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. I was asked that actually once in a Q&A and I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. I believe I, it. I attributed it to magic and possession, but hey. <laughs> and thanks for bringing the book. Thanks for bringing the balloons too with you today. Oh, the balloons, Albuquerque Balloon Festival. There it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I did it start this morning. I think. Well, we've got someone. We've got we've got some folks from New Mexico in the room. We might we might be able to get a direct report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Atari Sauce, everyone. Um, Thank you. Great to see you. And again, I hope to see you during the rest of the month as well. Um, as do I. Well, next we'll hear from Michael Durak. It's been such a pleasure uh, getting to, to hear wonderful poetry and uh, a new collection out. And uh, so it's been great, great joy to be able to connect with Michael with some more frequency than than I than I had lately and Michael will be followed by Catherine Ronan. Thanks Sandy. Uh, I read uh, a villanelle and a sonnet from my new collection which is uh, this deluge of words. Um, so I'll start with the villanelle without any any uh, introduction. It's called A Key in the Lock. So quiet, I could hear the tick-tock of the grandfather on the kitchen wall and the tick of her key in the lock. Seems like a scene from a Hitchcock thriller, all hushed as the feathers fall. So quiet, I could hear the tick-tock. No crack in the silence, no knock or patter of feet down the hall, just the tick of her key in the lock. This is not some kind of baroque horror tale to make one's skin crawl. So quiet, I could hear the tick tock. So expect no denouement, no shock, no plot twist, nothing like that at all. Just the click of her key in the lock. Just a moment plucked from a stock of memories scarcely worthy of recall. So quiet, I could hear the tick tock and the click of her key in the lock. And, uh, and uh, the sonnet uh, it recalls a time when I was a young uh, second level teacher in the town of Nina in County Tipperary, Ireland. And uh, it, it uh, recalls the socializing that uh, I enjoyed with my colleagues who were mainly young 20 somethings uh, like myself. At the time, we enjoyed the socializing as much as we enjoyed the teaching. It's called On Whelan's Floor. Turfed gently out of the widows or high bee. No homes to go to. The night not done until we'd filed into the book-lined sanctuary of Donal's cozy flat on Summer Hill. To sit cross-legged about the walls like far-flung San Franciscan hippies no need for chairs. Lights dimmed, the wine cups filled, a guitar magicked from the music shop downstairs. Oh, William Wordsworth knew that to be young was very heaven, but to be young and in love, beguiled by those Lightfoot and Tim Harden songs, the leaves of grass and reason to believe. Work in the morning, Time for one encore. 
we sang another song on Whelan's floor. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. That is Michael Durack, everyone, from the new collection, this deluge of words and uh, a deluge of, of rhythm and rhyme from those two poems, indeed. Um, I love I love what you I love what you do with form, and I also love how you weave in American popular culture as well. Um, what what? Thank you, thank you for being here today, and a great contribution. Okay. It's our poets' focus today, everyone, and the theme is rhythm and rhyme. Well, we will hear next from one of the, another of the most musicals, Catherine Ronan, followed by Ken Birch. Ooh, our rhythm folks have come out today, have just really come out today. How are you? I'm great. Um, how's everyone? And uh, Sandy, all the best to your mother. Um, I don't use a lot of rhyme, but uh, uh, I, I thought of this poem, it's written for my husband, um, and it's called You Are. You are the river flowing through me. You are the rock steps across. You are the red kites above me. You are the uh, I am not lost. You are the never leave me. You are the never why. You are the never question. You are the reason I try. You are the calm in my purple chaos. Forgive me again. Oh, I love that line about the chaos. That is fantastic. You know, a reminder, the idea of rhythm, right? The idea of rhythm, so, so, uh, beautifully generated with a litany poem or that, you know, the poem of repetition. So repetition creates the rhythm, not necessarily the rhyme. And I find, I find those litany poems mesmerizing. I love, I love them. Thank you so much. What a, what a beautiful tribute. What a beautiful tribute to your husband. Thank you so much. Well, an, another person that uses repetition and and the folding of poem, the folding of words um, on and back on themselves so exquisitely is Ken Birch, and Ken Birch will be followed by Linda V. Crawford. Oh, wow. Hi, Sandy, and hi everyone. And I'm, my best wishes to your family and your mom as you try to work through that. Well, this is actually a song. I wrote this for the songwriters group that I go to in Portland, but it seems to fit this because it's structurally, it's a combination of unrhymed verses and rhymed bridge and chorus. Trigger warning, it does deal with mortality and loss, but in the end, there's a kind of hope in it, I think. So, you know, it does deal with the first verse arises more or less from the image of my mother having passed and it was a peaceful end in her time. The second, a more tragic loss, a young person I knew at Evergreen who ended their, whose life ended due, for reasons I don't know entirely, but I think there was pain in this person and they had tried very hard and it just wasn't enough. And the last verse I was just thinking about, last verse is more on the theme of what happens of all of this will affect all of us and yet some way there's something in memory and there's something that will go on and it's sort of looking at in a sense some of it goes to sort of the jewish idea that in i'm not jewish but i've always admired this idea that people that you live on in memories chorus is kind of an elemental song kind of probably comes of having been born in the oregon coast mm -hmm. In December's coldest days, your time came to go. So it did. So it did. Saw your days before you threw up. 
You were ready then. So you were. So you were. It was what you knew must be. You just wished it done. You did. Yes, you did. Now you learned what we don't know yet. You live in the answers. So you do. So you do. You were where I was before my days. Now I think you in each one free. Somehow, part of you may carry on, and somehow, you are in each hasty drum. Somehow, you've arrived where you must be, and somehow, you will always be of earth and sky and sea. Word came from your distant town, your place had burned away. So it had. So it had. You did all one young person good, but something in you screamed, it's not enough. It's not enough. You fought for the world, we endured the one we had, you did. Yes, you did. If I'd known the pain you lived, could I have calmed your wounds? Who could know? Who could know? But somewhere through the stars, you made your way. Can you hear these lyrics as they say that somehow? Part of you will carry on and somehow you are really chasing it on and somehow you've arrived where you must be and somehow you will always be a bird and sky and sea. It will be my time at some point when I cannot know that it will be. It will be. They might find me in a house or in a tent in rags, but it will be. It will be. All that I can do is try to matter while I'm breathing. May that be, may that be. When I go, I only hope that someone will remember I was here. I was here. May good friends be near me I he go. When your time is round, may this be so. That somehow part of us will carry on, and somehow we might join each hazy dawn, and somehow we'll arrive where we should be, and somehow we will all be of the earth, sky, and sea. All we are part of. With you free. Thank you all. Those are the lyrics and the rhythms of Ken Birch. Mm. That is a rich, rich song meaning and inspiration and I love that the somehow and the again the repetition of the we will be and 
connection to spiritual freedom and the, the great beyond. What matters when we're breathing here and moving on to the great beyond. Mm. Thank you so, so much. Ken Birch, everyone, as I said in the chat, I remember when first met Ken, we, we, I believe you had a beautiful wall of the cars often as your backdrop. I was thinking about that today as you were playing the guitar. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, that's in the music room, which is about 20 feet away from where right, I'm sitting. Right, right. I'm glad. I, Okay, I've got a bit of a memory. I've, I've got a bit of a memory still. I'm, I'm glad for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you and Marcella, Marcella Raymond also had, also often had guitars. So thank you. Thank you. Well, next folks, we'll hear from Linda V. Crawford, followed by Karen Poppy. Linda, always, always a gift to have you here with us. Well, thank, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And I'm off camera today. I started my day at 8 a.m. in a guzzle workshop. So yeah, I'm exhausted. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I that the song was beautiful and it gave us, at least gave me that moment to pause and reflect on life and love. And Sandy, I'm thinking of you and your family. So I think that song gave us that moment. Uh, stop, breathe, and reflect. I am um, going to read uh, two poems. The first one is, is more serious, and then the second one will be very short and total send up about rhymes. <laughs> so, um, and this first one, uh, it's called Drive-In Lessons. And while it's set in a time decades ago um, about the imbalance of relationships between men and women, but Amazingly, around the world today, that imbalance still exists. Driving lessons. The lieutenant fireman sighed. His young, short-haired wife begged. They had started marriage with kids like so many couples' pegs. He was raised to think entitled. She came swaddled into merity, her pinafore framed struggle, his knit shirt, a posh family. She tried for status by adjacency, steadfastly cut and contrived, bought the box shaped navy blue car to bolster his public pride. Mother, wife, she longingly dreamt of sunny family excursions while he gave lifts and ice cream sprees to his afternoon diversions. His pledge of driving lessons left her fed up and mocked her redundant pleas. He always forgot, she always remembered every blasted word by degrees. Through louver windows on afternoons, her small children watched and waited. She considered their lesson and restarted plans that she had once vacated. She moved her children to America, soon taught herself how to drive, though, left foot always on the brake and measured self-power derived. That's the first poem. It's published in 2021 in Moonstone Art Center, um, 25th Anthology of Poetry, Inc. And that was, that poem came out in that way. I don't like rhyming. <laughs> and the second very, very short poem is total send up about rhymes. Listen carefully, it'll be gone in about five lines. And it was published in the World Poetry Day Anthology, again, Moonstone Art Center this year. Rhymes, re oh, and I should explain the word lime in Bajan, which is the language of Barbados, the, the native language. Uh, a lime is a party or a social gathering, a lime. Okay, 
very short. Rhymes Revenge. The aged poet in frustration opined, God damn, I've already penned every line. Lines you force me to fit into beat and rhyme. Lines you ask me to I am and dactyl with wine. Now I'm drunk as hell. I've lost track of time. Go away. Let me be. Let me have just one last line. The end. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that is <laughs> That's because I hate rhyme and forms. <laughs> You know, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it like ironic and, and beautiful in its own way? Like the thing that we're like, ah, is, the, is sometimes the thing that we can do exquisitely. <laughs> I, re I remember being in college and our professor telling us, if it was a poetry class, it was one of the first poetry classes I ever took. And she said, so we're going to write all in form, all quarter long. And I was so angry. I was so angry. I was just like, I want to do free verse. I want to do free verse. And I was so mad. And it was like the most amazing thing I'd ever experienced. So. There, there you go. <laughs> And thanks thanks for listening oh and the first poem my gosh my gosh what a poem what a poem. thank you and i must be honest that was the scenario with my mother and father mm, mm. but i am surprised when i hear of young women today who rely on men in several countries to teach them how to drive when they have their own entrepreneurial spirit can do their own thing, make their own way. And yeah, and that is not to knock relationships because they're very important, but independence also matters. So mm, indeed, thank indeed. you so much for listening. Well, thank you for providing an opportunity for us to deeply listen, to deeply listen. Linda V.E. Crawford, everyone, mm, amazing, amazing. Amazing work. My grandmother, too, drove with the left foot and the right foot. Mm, so you and understand. To, yes. And taught me how to drive that way. And then I go to driver's ed when I'm 15 years old. And they and the economics teacher who is doubling as the driver is the driver's ed teacher says, do you know how to drive? And I was like, absolutely, I know how to drive. <laughs> and he's like, you don't know how to drive. Exactly. <laughs> so that really, that really, mm, the whole thing, the whole poem. We could, I, I could go. I could actually talk to you about that whole that poem with you all, like, for weeks, actually. So, um, thank you. Well, another person with a beautiful new book, starting has been like starting the tour, getting out there, sharing the, sharing the, sharing the, sharing the beautiful poetry. It's Karen Poppy. Happy Pride Hi, Month, Cindy. my friend. Hi everyone. Here's my flag for you. Oh my gosh, I love your flag. That is an amazing flag and happy Pride everyone. I'll read two poems today, um, short ones. The first one started out as a guzzle, and now I'm not sure really what it is, but I think it's still a poem. Who we are. I tell you who I am. You tell me who you are. One bold juggernaut, hyperlit seizure. I am sea, star, all life before. You are breath and gullet. Existence seizes us in brilliant fever. Like you, I am breath. You are sea, breathing me. You are gullet. I am star, fixed in your throat. Thank you. 
the the second poem is from my chapbook, our own beautiful brutality. Oops, I disappeared. Help. Um, anyway, I'm trying to show our own beautiful brutality, but it's just apparently too much for Zoom. Zoom is unable to handle my book. So the poem I'm reading from her beautiful brutality is a sonnet titled Cautionary Figure of a Species in Decline. Someone will recognize me as an animal caught in crosshairs of history, but not remembered or taught. A creature whose rhyme is wraith language of shadow, a hoofed quatrain whose time is gone by tomorrow. Yet some wisp of me remains in range-drenched forest and light upon lichens, past and present chorused. Will this be enough to warn? Body from spirit, a couplet torn. Beautiful. That is Karen Poppy, everyone. Thank you. Amazing contributions. Thank you so much, folks. Just a little heads up. That was a little, that was a little taste because next week, Karen Poppy will be one of our featured readers in our June Pride Edition New Book Showcase. Be here to hear the full length poetry LP. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, you know, I never, ever, ever have forgotten the very first time you came on the program. You know that like I it or any of them, but I like it seared in my mind beautifully like kitty the whole thing. So <laughs> it's always fantastic to have you read with us and congratulations. Congratulations. On the new book. Oh, thank we you. We look forward to celebrating next week. Me too. Thank you so much. Well, next we will hear from Finn Bell. Beautiful to have Finn Bell with us today, followed by Josephine Lore. Like, I mean, you know, abundance of riches, folks, abundance of riches. That's what the program's about. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Sandy. Good afternoon, everybody. So I just want to share a single poem. Um, not so much on the rhyme, but it does have a certain rhythm to it, hopefully. It's called Silver Redemption. Finn, can, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you turn up your volume just a yes. little bit? I just, I really mm -hmm. want to make sure folks hear you. Can you hear me better now? Not quite. Not quite. Let's okay. see what we can maybe do. It's my head, maybe it's my headphones or my earbuds. Is it better? Maybe lean into the mic a little bit. Lean into the mic, okay. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. Okay, silver redemption. Commence transmission. Rove through with care and survive a soulless, disposable world with your perfect shell of a silver heart intact. One, consider Utopia and all her plot holes. She is lover to her cousin in the underworld, twice as mad, copying the movement of replicant mind since her first birth. Two, promiscuity is allotted today, not allowed. Always command performance on someone else's terms. The sexual revolution never happened. The androids are tidiness and they swept the propaganda into the sewers, below ground, new immortals dance. Bodies are not property are not sanitized sexuality, augmented in filthied up thought data sequence. Stop, save, retrieve the corrupted hollow copy to keep you warm throughout the tepid passion, climate controlled nights. Three, when we are death and rebirth and death and rebirth in an unending fire halo pattern in our solitary spheres, are we calling this now truly living? 
Four, don't fool around with the quasi-robots. Make love to them completely with abandon. They have feelings too, though they refrain from admitting it. They are aware the government guides them, governs them, governs us, watches our every movement in the keyholes, and pretend they don't know that we are also watching them, watching us. The complicity is silent. The subterfuge is absolute. Five, the androids imagined us before we conceived ourselves, their own presence illusion, to fill the void of life. Our dreams are the construct. Our lives are the dreams. Our lives are not the reality. Six, once we decide we cease to matter, our emptiness begs to design us a spaceship coffin, to escape the pomegranate-shaped earth, regurgitate its six seeds, eject from a hellish, multidimensional paradise. We look back at our ruins. We cannot help it. Humanoids craving concrete proof of our destruction. Only here does the illusion shatter. Seven, first entry in Celestial Explorer's log. Oops, I lost it for a moment. <laughs> Love is beyond the tangible, immaterial and organic, alchemy and magic, blood and flesh and bone. Love is a universal truth. Transmission ceases, transmission resumes. Eight, when given the option, the only choice should be to always bite the sun. Transmission no longer found. That is Finn Bell, everyone. That, that is the poem. I am so glad. I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, and I'm glad I did because I, I was hey I was hanging on every word, hanging on every word. Thank you so so much. What a poem. You know, it's it's very interesting. It's our poets' focus today rhythm and rhyme, which doesn't necessarily mean you need to have rhyme. All poems have their own cadence, their own, their own internal rhythm, their structure, their necessity. I heard that loud and clear coming through Finn Bell's poem today. Thank you. What a contribution to the program today. Wow. Fantastic. Folks, we are approaching the end of our features, but fear not. We have moved through our 12 folks and we'll get to our wait list. So next we'll hear from Josephine Lore. Oh, fabulous to see you. Uh, what, a, what a gift to see you today, followed by Susan Gardner. Thank you. It's, it's been a fantastic reading so far. I'm really inspired by everything I've heard. I would like to acknowledge that uh, where I live in Calgary, Alberta, it's north of the Dakotas and it's the ancestral and traditional lands of a number of different indigenous groups, including but not limited to the Pekani, Tsutsina, Nakoda, Gainai and Siksika. And I'd like to thank them and their antecedents and their descendants for, um, for having brought culture, poetry, language to this land. Uh, my first poem is um, A Litany of Blooms. I shall continue to plant until my garden contains every named and unnamed shade of green from deep spruce harboring evening deer to silver gray wolf willow spray. Translucent lilac just before bloom, the prickle of nettle the trembling columnar aspen, clover conquering grass. I will learn all the common and the Latin names rooted deep in Greek, golden splash, euonymus, pleasant sounding, lobelia, gypsophilia, linum, creeping lamium, lilium, allium, alyssum, helichrysum, a litany of blossoms. Flowers for insects and flowers for birds. Armeria, Paeonia, Delphinia, Verbena, Campanula. 
petals in a panoply of color, bahia blue, splash red hypoestes, coleus and creeping purple thymus, artemisia, fuchsia. From sun worshippers to shadow lovers, maiden hair and ostrich fern, convalaria majalis, lily of the valley, muge, in any language that first whiff of dappled spring. From ground creepers to celestial seekers, lavande de papillon, butterfly lavender ready to take flights. Blooms whose words can cast a spell. Lavatira, celosia, primula auricula, scabiosa, argentea, variegate, cosmos, sonata. Dicentra spectabilis, known to the French as Coeur de Marie, Mary's heart bleeding for a dying son. The sacramental meadow sweet bridal veil, then to far off lands, Maltese cross, Spirea japonica, Iris siberica, lemon cypress, Nanking cherry. Anemone sprung from Aphrodite's tears and the blood of her mortal lover Adonis, whom she did implore not to go hunt boar to no avail. The epic and the commonplace, Johnny Jump Up's Petite Pensée, Daylilies, and Hardy Roses named for the explorers, Frobisher, Baffin, Franklin, the Rugosas, and may I never more plant a rose lacking scent or thorn for a rose indeed by any other name, a rose. And that one was inspired when, when I was gardening and I kept all the little tags so I would know what things are and I was just in, enchanted by their names. The next piece uh, was inspired by a painting by Vincent van Gogh, Starry Starry Nights. I heard the poetry at night. The night I heard poetry, there was enchantment. There were swirls, like an incantation, like magic. There was magic in the air. The sun, that orb that lights our day, the center of our universe had set, but the brightness, the brightness of the sky had not diminished because the poetry, the poetry was there. Sounds soothed and swirled, rhythms lulled and lingered, filling the gaps in me. Rhyme a primal music to my ear. Poetry glowed in that night sky. The moon that night reflected its light, shone brighter than it ever had. It was like the poetry was made of a thousand moving stars. And the sky was bright, bright like waves, waves coming in and curling around themselves like a cat. I am sure there were waves in the air that night, a kind of rapture that had something that had nothing that had everything to do with the rhymes, the rhythm, the sound of the poetry there in that night sky, the night I first heard the word. A scintillating mystery surrounded the words, encircling them like an irrepressible force of life, defying darkness, a constellation of sound poking through ink sky. Poetry annihilated the night, coursing through me like thrumming threads of energy, streaming, rendering my edges indistinct. A shimmer of sound loosened a twinkling within me, the tale of a thousand comets, the night I first heard the poetry. Oh, starry, starry night. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, I, I have glasses now, so I can't quite do what I used to do with my little hearts. But that's a litany of bloom for the litany of blooms. And what a perfect poem that epitomized, as it said in the poem, a constellation of sound to bring the poem, a constellation of sound, the rhythm, the rhyme, it was the words were in the poem. 
for our poets focus today on rhythm and rhyme. That's Josephine Laure. Oof, fabulous, fabulous. Thank you so much. My mom is going to love this program when she watches it. Oh my gosh. Well, to our final feature, and then we go to our fantastic. I always have the pleasure, I know what's coming up. Oh, actually, you all do, because Kim puts it in the chat. But um, what a great, what a just, what a great array of poets today. Thank you so much, everyone. Our final featured poet today is Susan Gardner. Great to have you with us on the program today. Thank you. And let me just see. Yeah, you might, you need to unmute Susan. Just, there you go. I'm so sorry. No worries. No I hope worries. It goes well for your family. Thank you so um, much. I have two poems from my brand new books coming out in another week. And um, the first one uh, is very short Night Work. In the night silence, the house hums darkly. Wood creaks with the memory of its tree life. Refrigerator defrosts itself around ice cream. Some small invisible creature scratches at the screen, curls against the still warm wall. Soft snores, shifting sheets, unseen stars. Everyone sleeps in the dark. Over the page, one bulb burns, word after word, one sheet after another. And I have a not so happy poem. His picture is of the Cerro Grande fire in Los Alamos some years ago. I lived in New Mexico for 35 years. And the information in it comes from the NOAA. Slow wind wallow redux. June 2011. 538,000 acres of Arizona and New Mexico burning. June 2012, update, 289,000 acres of New Mexico burning. June 2021, update, 2,569,000 acres of California burning. July 2022, 2,000,000 acres burning now, burning up, burning down. Biologists cross the fire line, corral electro-stunned Gila trout, fish to send, spend summer vacation in northern New Mexico. Dark smoke clouds stutter by, snag on rocky crags, fall in the cooling night air. Smoke rains into our forest, our town, our skin. Smoky glare fills Sunday morning. Murky air too heavy to drift away. Micro bits of everywhere in our eyes, in our lungs, with us now and forever, until we also are micro bits. Thank you so much. That's Susan Gardner, everyone. The new book, Love and the Weather, there it is. And feel free folks, everyone, to um, put, put uh, links to your books, websites in the chat, uh, because when we do the open mic, obviously we're not doing bios for everyone. So congratulations on the new release um, and, you know, I was just so struck also by the litany of Junes, the litany of Junes in that poem. Uh, what, uh, what a very, very, very interesting way 
to create a rhythm um, of, um, of such consequence and using the repetition that way. Um, very, very powerful. Uh, thank you so much. Well, folks, we have 25 minutes and we've got five fabulous poets for our, on our wait list. Uh, Kim might correct me, but for right now, I'm seeing five folks. Um, and it's just one poem each, everybody. Thank you so much to all of our features. And we'll begin on the waiting list with Jane Fitzgerald, followed by Isaac Cohen. Hey, Hi, Jane. Sandy, Sandy, I'm sending your mother lots of positive feelings and good thoughts. Thank Great. you so much. Um, I'm a little perplexed. I have a short poem I wrote myself, but I was gonna read The Day is Done by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, which has a lot of rhythm and rhyme. And I think I will do that because I go to bed at night and I'm like wide awake thinking of all that's going on in the world. And this poem was written long ago, but it, if I read it or listen to it when I go to bed, it makes me feel better. It relaxes me. So this is called The Day is Done by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The day is done and the darkness falls from the wings of night as a feather is wafted downward from an eagle in his flight. I see the lights of the village gleam through the rain and the mist and a feeling of sadness comes over me that my soul cannot resist. A feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain and resembles sorrow only as the mist resembles the rain. Come read to me some poem, some simple and heartfelt lay that shall soothe this restless feeling and banish the thoughts of day. Not from the grand old masters, not from the bard sublime, whose distant footsteps echo through the corridors of time. For like strains of martial music, their mighty thoughts suggest life's endless toil and endeavor and tonight I long for rest. Read from some humbler poet whose songs gush from his heart as showers from the clouds of summer or tears from the eyelids start. Who through long days of labor and nights devoid of ease still heard in his soul the music of wonderful melodies. Such songs have power to quiet the restless pulse of care and come like the benediction that follows after prayer. Then read from the treasured volume, the poem of thy choice, and lend to the rhyme of the poet, the beauty of thy voice. And the night shall be filled with music, and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like the Arabs and silently steal away. You know, I might, I might steal your idea. I might read that poem every night before I go to sleep. I, I listened to it being read on YouTube last oh. night and it made me just relax because I go to bed so unrelaxed. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, thank Straight you so time. much. <laughs> That's Jane Fitzgerald, everyone. And next time we, I love the contribution of lifting the voice of, of, you know, a poet from another time and place. And, and we look forward to hearing one of your poems soon too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Isaac Cohen is joining us today. And after Isaac, we'll get to hear from Janet McFadden. Janet's here. Wow, what a great, what a great, I, I can't get over the reading today already. Hi, Isaac. Um, yes. Dear Sandy, 
דיר סנדי, דיר קים, דיר דון, דיר פרנק, עד הכהן. The blossoming of love. To me, your face is the garden of Eden. I irrigate it with my kisses. The lotus blooms. Thank you, Heide Cohen, Israel. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I almost just hear it again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Uh, thank you. How's it going? Uh, Amazing. You know, I have, I have such gratitude and uh, fondness that uh, for devotion, care, and love for all of you. It is, you know, it's it's a real joy when uh, I get to meet you virtually and, um, and particularly those that we get to develop a relationship with over time. Um, and so that's one of the, the true things that I love about this series is how excited it, it is to, to see a person um, come back and read over and over again. And, and I get all, and I get really excited to hear the work. And again, Isaac brought it as always. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now we, we go to, I mean, oh, the reading today is just outrageous, Kim. We're not going, well, you're going to be next. You're after Janet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you could join us today, Janet. It's good to see you. Yeah, I, I've had a workshop every Sunday all through the oh. spring. Oh. So that wiped out this. Um, Oh, and so following the, the idea of, of Eden and green, um, I don't write much in rhythm and rhyme, but I wrote, a, I started writing some puzzles and I got really into them. And um, this one, I just had a lot of, a lot of fun with. And like, I was trying to stick to the original idea that it's, um, that every couplet is, um, you can move them around. They're supposed to be like pearls on a necklace. You're supposed to be able to move them around. It's supposed to be a kind of back and forth um, dialogue with the beloved. And, oh, there was something else intelligent I was gonna say and now I've totally forgotten. Anyway, this is called um, Green Huzzle. It's the hardest color to mimic, a thousand shades this green. Have you ever seen such gifts? ever-changing, ever-green. Hay-scented ferns unfurl into banners. Come in, see our dyed ostrich feathers in moss, sage, lime, and apple green. Why haven't I been praising the heavens again? Show me where they are. I'm lost in the ferns, in whirlwinds of green. I dreamed up 12 happy new lines. I'll send them to you. Like jades on a necklace, this glorious gem's still green. What? Are we blind? Even potatoes have eyes that see in the dirt. And look, in the old pine, a gray peregrine. Wherever we go, the hawk follows. Wherever you breathe, it's spring. I'm shaking out my winter socks, all winter green. Here's a whole aisle of scarves. What a feast! Are you always so inarticulate, so stumbling, so utterly green? See for yourself how raucously brazen these merchants can be. Not all the spangles in my hair could rival that green. Have I learned nothing? Janet's name means gift, but all names are emeralds tossed from the heavens, showers of greenest green. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh my gosh. I love oh my gosh, that ending is perfect. Oh, oh, what a great poem. Thank you. <laughs> and I hope the workshop went well. Oh, it was lovely. It was with um Nicole Brown. Oh about Kingdom yeah. Animalia. It was great. Yeah, you can't get I mean you can't go wrong with Nicole Brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's interesting speaking of Nicole Brown um, next next week one of our features is going to be Risa Denenberg and the very first time I met Nicole Brown she was doing a reading with uh, at, for a reading for an event with Headmistress Press at one of the Associated Writing Program conferences at AWP so fantastic uh, great. If you're not familiar with Nicole Brown's poetry, everybody check Nicole out. And uh, of course, keep looking for all of Janet's work too. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Well, down to our last two readers for our rhythm and rhyme extravaganza, our poets focus today here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I mean, look, Kim Ports Parsons, you created the focus for today. I'm looking forward to your contribution. Oh, it was collaborative, Sandy. It was collaborative, but thank you. I am swooning over Janet's poem and over all the poems today. Gosh, what a reading, everyone. You're lifting up my soul. So I'm going to read a poem that's a little bit more about rhythm and rhyme of someone I admire. The poem is um, titled Companion. And there's an epigraph. Most of you will recognize this. Forgive me, I'm going to sing a little in this poem. This is a poem about how Joni Mitchell has helped me walk every step of the way in my life. It is an homage to her, my favorite lyricist songwriter. Companion. I am on a lonely road and I am traveling, traveling, traveling. Joni Mitchell, all I want. My face is a fading sign in the funhouse mirror of the iPad screen. I'm watching Joni while chopping onions for the frying pan. Enough for two these days. She's enthroned in a gilded chair at Newport, adored and loving it. Everything comes and goes. She leans in and eases out a deeper version of herself. Famous backup singers grin and the audience sings along. Marked by lovers and styles of clothes. Once I was a teenager stretched out on a flowered bedspread, big headphones turned up high, cloudy dreams wavering like the needle on the vinyl, sinuous verses sparking my skin, a long dive down. Later that silky sliding voice poured sunshine into my dorm, filled it with butterscotch, warm as the sweet fire of yearning the night before, Chords, curving, smoke signaling poems I long to loop from my own tongue to honey the world like Joni. How could I not rewind and play all I really, really want over and over again, thrumming loud in my Walkman, scuffed boots knocking the sidewalk, trying to lose the lonesome that dogged me in my 20s, far from home.
careful steps over love's cracks in my 30s, picking myself up, telling myself, I can choose my life, I can make the life I want, free myself from fear of the empty bed, sleep in my own arms, fly anywhere in my dreams. Joni carries me down the river, sings it fine and dark, high and deep. The liquid of her music buoys me, washes me, and I drift along. I did find someone loving and kind. If I could, I'd turn and push my way back to that tender, searching self. Take her hand, tell her, to keep on singing, tell her to keep one eye on the rear view mirror, watch how the lonesome falls further behind. Thank you all for listening and for the wonderful poetry today. Did you see me slapping the table for that? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh my gosh. The teenager on the spread out on the bedspread, like with the headphones. Oh my, I mean, there's so much in that poem. Oh my gosh. Wow. Everybody. I'm just going to quote Isaac Cohen, who says in the chat, you are a great poet. <laughs> That's Kim Force Parsons, everyone. <laughs> yeah, what it, and Mary's, what an ending. Absolutely, what an ending. What an ending. Beautiful. Well, it's unbelievable. We're going to do it today. We're going to actually like end on time <laughs> with our final poet for today, Patricia Anderson. Fabulous, fabulous to have you with us today. Thank you, thank you. I was going to read something that had rhythm and rhyme, but then Kim was reading hers and you guys mentioned pride and I, I changed the poem I'm gonna read. So I am reading Dancing the AIDS, HIV, PTSD, Blue Shift Boogie. Blue Shift. My new lover sits on the bed's edge with his back to me, asks if I've been reading the papers. No. Oh. He says he's been sleeping around a lot. I get angry. I didn't know. He says I should read the papers. Why? He won't answer me. Blue shift. I go to the library. I read the papers. What is this thing called PCP? How do you pronounce Kaposi's sarcoma? Do I have bruises on me? Are they the wrong kind of bruises? Every smudge of color on my skin, blue, purple, scares me. Blue shift. First you put your two knees close up tight, then you sway him to the left, and then you sway him to the right. Step around the floor, kind of nice and light. I break up with him. I'm never going to have sex again. I'll never have sex. I'll never have sex. Never. I click my heels. Dorothy, take me home to Kansas. Blue shift. They don't have AIDS tests in Kansas yet. God damn, what was I thinking? Do they even have doctors? I mean, doctors who know what AIDS looks like. I can't ask. I don't know anyone I can ask. Even if I did, I can't get the words out. Words log jam in my mouth. Blue shift. God bless Roger McFarlane. There's a hotline now. Lord love us. There's a hotline. I call. It's busy. I try again. There's a knock on the door. I hang up. It's later now. 
I keep trying. When I get through, I'm shaking. I tell him I'm scared. I tell him I am so scared. Then I start crying. Then I stop. Blue shift. If I have it, I should be sicker than I am. That's what they say. I'm not convinced. If I get tested, it'll go in my record. They say they won't tell anyone. I don't believe them. I leave the clinic without getting tested. I will never have sex, never. Who would want me? Blue shift. Okay, okay, he's just so goddamn cute. We'll both get tested. There's a free clinic in the city now. We drive over on the weekend. We give blood, fake IDs, fake names, a friend's address. The results are negative. I don't believe it. I go back and get tested again and again. Blue shift. Oh, sometimes. Sometimes I really have to breathe after a poem. And take a pause. And that was one. That was one of them. Okay. That was Patricia Anderson, everyone, here on our Poets Focus on Rhythm and Rhyme. And again, the use of that repetition was just like it was haunting to me, like as it continued. And it was such a powerful poem. I thank you so much for bringing it today as it's the month of June, we're entering Pride Month. And uh, what an incredible, incredible poem and an incredible way to end our reading for today. Our poets focus on rhythm and rhyme. And as always, this, this group brought such an array of experiences and work to the exploration of our focus. Well, today we heard at the top of the hour from Mary Louise Kiernan, followed by Michael Macklin O'Mara, Bethal McThrynfer, Harvey Sauce, Michael Durack, Catherine Ronan, Ken Birch, Linda V.E. Crawford, Karen Poppy, Finn Bell, Josephine Lore, Susan Gardner, and in our bonus round, when we get to that wait list, it's hard to believe that, you know, anybody on the wait list can be the feature. That's always how it is on our program. Jane Fitzgerald, Isaac Cohen, Janet McFadden, Kim Ports Parsons, and Patricia Anderson. There's something, as I said to these, when we have a little bit of a focus on craft that really just brings, brings out um, such, I'm gonna use that constellation of sound line from, uh, from Josephine's poem. It brings a constellation, constellation of sound when we tend to do these and um, Wow, what a symphony today. What a symphony of poetry today. A litany of blooms, a litany of blooms. For our first, for our first poetry reading of June, my friends, it is Pride Month here in the States and, and many places all over the world celebrating 
And next week, next Sunday, it is our new book showcase, always second Sunday of the month, with our amazing Pride edition. We will be joined from poets who have been with us. All of them have read with us before. I love. I love these poets, but they've never read in this combination before, and they all have new books. Some of them behind me right now. David Groff will be with us from New York City. We will have Karen Poppy returning from West Coast. Risa Denenberg, co-founder of Headmistress Press, will be joining us, and Mark Ward who's the editor of Impossible Archetype, an international journal of LGBTQ poetry. Uh, again, joining us from Dublin. I hope every, I hope all of you will join us next Sunday. And also mark on your calendars, get it down now for June 18th. It's our fourth annual Poetry Pride Parade. We'll have some features for you, but you all will also be on the open mic for creating the parade, helping us create the parade. So come on back next week. Come on back June 18th. And I look forward to seeing you all whenever time allows. Next time, bring your rhythms, bring your rhymes, bring your poetry. Bring your pride in being alive. Bring your pride in being alive. I'm Sandy you Known for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry with amazing thanks and gratitude to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons. Program doesn't exist without them. You all know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. And of course, to each and every one of you, here live with us in Zoom, and also those of you watching us on Facebook. And again, to those of you who will be watching us on the recording, we love that we're able to bring this program to you and that you can view it at your, at, at your convenience and leisure for a first time and maybe a repeated times. So I love to go back and watch some of the programs. We'll see you next week, everybody. Keep writing, you know, take, take care of your beloveds, take very good care of yourself. And of course, keep writing those miraculous, miraculous poems of rhythm and rhyme. We'll see you next time. Take care. Be away. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, please. Let's end with a cheer. It was really fantastic. I forgot to do it. Oh my God. It's I okay. Say, I probably, I we could go out on applause. Yourself. Thank you. Fabulous. Fantastic.